Okay, a lot to go over today. A lot to go over. So it is Sunday, November 24th, 2019. And just a couple of days ago, we saw a huge, huge dip in the market. And uh, there's a lot of things that could have been a factor, uh, that may, might be a factor. I am not going to go over all those things. There's a tons of there's tons of videos out there that looks at all those uh, scenarios and what it could possibly be. My job was to go back and think about to myself, and then to also educate everybody on this channel, is that when these types of crashes happen, and they're gonna happen more often than not, you're gonna see it in the next three months, six months, it doesn't matter, it's just gonna keep happening, it's gonna be dips up and down. So <clears throat> we have to remember is why we are here. Are we here for the short-term gain of trying to get rich in a month? Or are we thinking to ourselves, okay, this is why I invested into it. <clears throat> this is what's going on behind the scenes. And this is why I believe in it. So when I was going through this a couple of days ago, um, I didn't want to put a video out. I just didn't because I felt like it would be a reactionary video. And um, all the things that come out are just guesses anyhow. So uh, who cares? What I want to do is go over uh, the things that people are doing behind the scenes some technology that's happening uh, so we can all realize just what the hell we got ourselves into. So this information was all spurred by the, the, the modern investor or TMI. He's one of the channels that I listen to when I want some really in-depth information and I always have his channel in my description so you guys can take a look over there uh, for more detailed stuff. And what he put out, this was two days ago, it was pretty funny. It was uh, the crypto market is stupid and it's long. It's an hour and a half. Well, I was driving from um, Houston to El Paso, so I figured I'd just listen to it on the way over, and it was it was great. It was it was fantastic, and when it went over, was it the same things I want to go over with you guys, which is you know why exactly we invested into this and where the whole market's going. So not to go too deep into the weeds, these are the things I want everybody to look back on every time there's a crash. So one of those articles or one of the, those pieces of information is something like this. There is a, it's not really a secret, but there is a, uh, a Swiss mountain bunker where millionaires stash their Bitcoins. And this was like, this was a while ago. This was back in October 2017. So this is quite, quite a bit of time. It's still there. It's still going on. It uh, was, I mean, it was bored out and it's, I don't know if it's owned by Zappo. XAPO, I'm probably saying that wrong, I could care less, but um, they have a, they are there storing their data, their client's data of Bitcoin. And I thought to myself, well, I mean, that's great, you know, some millionaires have some Bitcoin, you know, what do they got? You know, like they got like 10, 5, 10 Bitcoin, maybe 100 Bitcoin. Where's how much they really have in that mountain? Let me just scroll, scroll down here. 7%. 7% of all the existing Bitcoins in the world. And that's about <clears throat> $10 billion. $10 billion. Uh, that's not the big thing. I mean, it's not a $10 billion. It's 7% of all Bitcoin is in this one location. Can you imagine if there was 7% of the world's currency just in one location trying to keep that safe? That would be amazing. Anyhow, so you have all these millionaires and they are pooling their resources and they are sticking in, in this vault. And this, this vault, of course, it is like highly secure. The, uh, the doors themselves are four tons to uh, protect against uh, a nuclear explosion. Also an EMP pulse. It is like top of the line and it's all in cold storage. So that's just one of the things that's going on. So what you have to look at is not what people are saying but what they are doing. And when I talk about that, I talk about people like, like Jamie Dimon. You know, he's the CEO of JP Morgan, Chase Bank, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, years ago, he was like, this is trash, this is garbage, I don't want to talk about it. Later on, it was discovered that he was also, uh, looks like he was investing into Bitcoin. And he also went ahead and started his own uh, digital currency or he, a stable coin, the, the, the JP coin, whatever, it's a piece of trash. But it doesn't matter. But you look at it and you go, okay, well, this guy's, uh, first he was against Bitcoin and blockchain. 
And then he comes out and says, all right, well, blockchain's okay. And then later on, as time moves forward, he is going to get into the cryptocurrencies that are available right now. And I'll talk about it, that in a second. But so you see something like that. One guy says something and he's doing something behind, behind closed doors, just like a banker would. New York Stock Exchange, they also bash it. And of course, their owner launches the futures contracts that pay out in Bitcoin, uh, commonly known as backed. We've got TD Ameritrade offering Bitcoin futures. Again, another another group that bash cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, and here they are. And also my favorite one, uh, Peter Schiff admits he owns Bitcoin, which is hilarious. If you don't know who Peter Schiff is, he's a big gold bug. He's been investing and has his own uh, reserves and uh, exchange or something. That, and he's heavily, heavily vested into gold. And of course, he says he now owns Bitcoin. Of course, in some of the other uh, interviews he talks about well I only got Bitcoin because people sent it to me now I just immediately changed over to fiat uh, I think that's a bunch of bullshit because here's the thing if you are an investor and that is your thing that you do you know you're gonna hedge your bet so if if I'm gonna hedge my bet I'm gonna look at some assets I can invest in gold why don't I hedge my bet with Bitcoin I guarantee fucking AT this guy has more Bitcoin than he lets on so this got me to thinking about this this mountain bunker who owns it again it was um, Zappo, X Apple, however you say it. And I thought to myself, well, well, who is that and what are they all about? So Xapo CEO, Exansis Saperis, I know I butchered that name, but he, he states it's irresponsible for investors, all investors, not to have any Bitcoin exposure. I thought it was an interesting article, took a look at it, but it gets even better. So uh, Xapo CEO wants this Caceres. I think he's from Argentina. Uh, he lays out an argument for Bitcoin to take up at least 1% of every, every investment portfolio. Okay, makes sense. If it goes big, hey, it goes big and you're a big winner. If it doesn't and then you only have 1%, you don't really lose that much. So he talks about, hey, if you have a 10 million um, allocation for some type of investment fund, then you should you know, at least put in 100,000. I don't have that. Uh, I'm guessing you might not have that, but if you could, if you put $100,000 into it now and it really does pay off, you could be making up to you know, 10, 15, 25 million just on your initial $100,000 investment. That's not important really. It's because it's not, it's not gonna apply to most of us. We're not gonna put $100,000 into Bitcoin. But he did bring up this uh, information that I had never heard of, but there's an investment legend, Biller, Biller Miller. I don't know if that's correct. Uh, it was Bill Miller, and they just screwed it up, or his name really is Biller Miller, which is a pretty cool name. It's a popular example of Gasaris logic. In July 2017, oh, what a great time to invest, Miller took up a 1% position on BTC, on Bitcoin. By mid-December 17, Bitcoin accounted for 50% of Miller's total asset under management. So what a great deal for that guy, right? He started at 1% in July, and by December it was 50%. He must have invested heavily into Bitcoin at its all-time high, and he probably sold it off because if he's that good at these types of things, he probably did. Now, if he still owns it, I mean, all those realized gains just went away, but he'd still be way up. So good for that guy. This was the biggest thing of the article for me, and this is a guy that had been investing in Bitcoin in the very early days. He, knew, he knows it very well. He has recommended to, to Bill Gates. He recommended to a lot of the uh, Silicon Valley people. He was the guy to really get Bitcoin into the minds of people in that level of, um, of monetary privilege. But he says, Caceres does agree that there exists the possibility that Bitcoin might not necessarily fail but become obsolete he says companies could create solutions on a protocol level that appeal more to users than bitcoin's current state and this is what it got to me and this is what i think most of us go through we we like the whole theory of bitcoin right we think about it we're like okay well it is decentralized it is deflationary uh, it can be used for payments it can be used for um, a store of value so it's a really good thing however as time has gone on, if you've been this in this game for a while, you'll know that, hey, you know what? Bitcoin didn't used to cost a lot of money uh, to pay. And then all of a sudden in 2018, it went up to like a ridiculous amount. It came out a little down in 2019 because of the Lightning Network, but it still costs a good amount of money to transfer your Bitcoin to somebody else. 
It was supposed to be extremely fast. It's now extremely slow. It was supposed to be then a store of value. And if we think about a store of value, if you think about somebody in like Venezuela, okay, and they their whole economy is rocked because they have all, it's, it's a communist country, and then they come in there and they say, okay, well, now you're going to use, you know, this type of, of, of money, and it's going to be worth this much. And all of a sudden, then, this, then their bank starts to print more money, and everything, the inflation rate goes through the, the effing roof. And before you know it, the money that you had, whatever they use for, for money over there, I don't know, uh, it, it becomes like now t you need 10x of the same thing, 10x of the same money to buy the same thing. So instead of a loaf of bread costing you a dollar, now it costs you ten dollars, or twenty, or thirty, or forty. So if you think about it, like, well, I'll just put in Bitcoin. So let's say that you did put in Bitcoin at the beginning of November. Well, guess what would have happened at the end, which is right now? You would have lost twenty-five percent of your money. So this can't be a store of value. This it's not. It's, it I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's not a store of value. Are you fucking kidding me? So. When I look at these types of things, I'm like, what really is it? What, what is the big thing? Now, I believe in Bitcoin. I believe it will work. It's a first mover. It has an advantage. But as time goes on, I don't think it will be the one. If you're old like me, you can remember back in the 90s when the internet kind of came about. The internet was a big thing. No one knew what the hell the internet was. And then when this thing called AOL came up, like oh I can get on the internet I just they would send you a they would send you a CD you would put it in your CD ROM drive you would you would um, load it up on your PC which was slow as hell and uh, you were off to the races and you would get to go to the internet and download things at like super slow speeds but it was awesome that was its first mover and AOL was was around for quite some time in 95 it had 3 million users uh, and it was the most recognized brand on the web in the US who here knows AOL now people like me who here uses AOL very few people nobody uses AOL I have an online business where I help nursing students pass their clinical exam and uh, when I when, it, when people register for my program when they put in their email address if it's at gmail i'm like oh, okay you know i know these guys are you know younger generation because most people use gmail but when i see things like hotmail and aol i'm like oh this person's old because nobody uses aol now but isn't it amazing first mover advantage aol had its peak and it was huge it was huge there was a deal for aol and time warner to combine and it was going to be like a 167 billion dollar combination or a, a merger and it got shot down something went something went wrong and then Verizon just a couple years ago uh, did get AOL purchased it for some reason I don't know why and it was like for four billion dollars so if you look at that you're like well AOL was it was a way ahead of its time it was the big thing Bitcoin was way ahead of its time it's the big thing what can happen I'm not saying that it won't be it could be AOL it could be Google I don't know you don't know nobody knows but I will tell you this, you need to hedge your bet. You need to hedge your bet because in the end, if you put all your eggs in one basket, that is a dangerous move. It's even, it's more dangerous than investing in cryptocurrency and digital assets. And that's just how I feel. So a lot of the YouTube channels, they will tell you, do your own research, do your own research. And I'm like, yeah, 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 that's what you're here for. I'm here to watch you so you can teach me. But really, you have to do it. And one of the reasons why I started this channel was because I was getting so much information from other people, I decided, you know what, to force myself to do my own research, I need to look at all the information out there and see what's BS and what's real and where everything is going. And these are just my opinions. Uh, you can totally disagree. If you're a Bitcoin maximalist, then you can tell me to stick it because you're like, hey, this doesn't make any sense to me. Or if you're a gold bug like Peter Schiff, uh, you can say, no, this is never going to work. I, that's, that's your opinion. These are my opinions. These are the research that I've done. And this is where I have gotten to at this point in my education of digital assets and cryptocurrency. So let's go down the rabbit hole a little bit. This is from the Nikkei Asian Review. And it talks about how this was one of the reasons two days ago for the collapse of Bitcoin. Because months ago, Xi Jinping, I was going to say Xi Jin Lao, close. 
Xi Jinping, he, this is months ago, months ago, he came out and said that he was a 100% believer in blockchain and it exploded the Bitcoin price. And we should have seen this coming because just two, three days ago, he came out and said, look, I believe in blockchain. I don't believe in Bitcoin or any, any other cryptocurrency for that matter. And I'm going to go so far as to say it's all a scam and a Ponzi scheme. But I do believe in blockchain. Now, if you've heard of Andreas Antonopoulos, he talks about this in a lot of his different uh, keynote speeches. He talks about the beginning of Bitcoin, middle of Bitcoin, and where it's going to go. And he says very clearly, in the middle parts of, of all of his speeches, he says governments and different institutions, they will come out and they will say the same thing. Blockchain over Bitcoin. Blockchain over Bitcoin. And I was like, well, you know, what's the difference? And the thing is, they're going to do that because Bitcoin allows for freedom because it is just it is a decentralized asset and anybody can trade it. But if you have your own centralized blockchain, you can control so much more. And that is what's going to happen with China. So let's get in this article real quick and where it eventually is going to lead us. So moving down. Uh, but this week, Beijing sent the record straight. China may be serious about cryptocurrencies, but only its own regulated version and not independent ones. China Central Television, CCT, the mouthpiece of the Communist Party, even called other cryptocurrencies financial fraud on Monday. And this is what caused the tumble. Uh, in a bid to secure financial sovereignty and enhance the global role of the yuan, uh, that's their plan to do. It's a bid to secure financial sovereignty when they are going to create their own blockchain and use it globally. Moving forward, it says, well, it says, what is China's digital currency and when will it be launched? China is not the only country to consider moving into digital money. Sweden's central bank has started to develop e-krona. Uruguay has piloted an e-peso and Bank of England Governor Mark Carney has proposed, proposed a new digital currency, currency too. But China will be the largest. This will be called the Digital Currency Electronic Payment, or DCEP. It will be issued by the People's Bank of China, the PBC, <laughs> PBC, and is meant to replace the existing money supply in the system, as well as notes and coins in circulation. So this is interesting. So it's not like they're going to just add it on, like printing more money. They're going to start to swallow up all those the paper money and coins in circulation and start to give their people this digital currency. And I'm going to show you in a little bit how this is going to make them massively control their people even more than it is right now. Mu Chang Chun, head of People's Bank of China's Digital Currency Research Institute. This is where they're getting all their information from. Mu Chang Chun, Digital Currency Research Institute. He says, the long-term desire is to widen the yuan's global acceptance by using the digital currency as a payment mechanism for China-funded projects across the world. So not just within China, but you got to play by China's game if you want to buy any products in China. It's an introduction of a Chinese digital currency would see Beijing steal a march on the U.S. and perhaps even begin to undermine the dollar's global dominance. Should Facebook's Libra enter the market, it would pose a threat to China's financial sovereignty. So before I move on, this is going to force the hand of every country out there. Every country is going to start to develop their own digital currency and or stable coin. And if you don't believe me, just watch the next year what's going to happen. If China does this, which they're doing it right now, and it's going to be available early next year, they're going to have their own blockchain. It's going to be centralized, and they're going to be able to spy on every one of their people. Because you know how easy it is to use cash? Cash is king. Let me tell you, I've run, I've run a bunch of businesses, and when you use cash, you can report as much as you want to, because who's going to know? It's just cash, right? Now, I always reported every single penny to the IRS. However, with cash, with yuan, with peso, with pounds, with euros, whatever you got, Paper money is harder to track. However, if you have a centralized blockchain, how hard would it be to track these types of things? And I'm going to show you how they're going to do it. So the PBC, the PBC, the PBOC has chosen a two-tier model whereby it will issue the digital currency 
to commercial banks and institutions. These organizations will then distribute it to the general public. By doing that, the PBOC expects to maintain the monetary status quo. For example, the digital currency would not be new money. Instead, it will substitute for notes and coins already in supply. That way, the PBOC will not have to pay interest to the public for holding the currency on their behalf, nor would it affect inflation, Mua said. As a result, there would be no implications for monetary policy or financial stability. So if they come out and they say, look, there's a hard cap of 100 billion, 200 billion, 500 billion, whatever it is that they're gonna state it is for this digital currency, great. They have effectively helped out with their inflation rates the same way that Bitcoin does, 21 million only, the same way that Litecoin does, the same way that XRP does at setting it at a certain amount that can ever be created or will be created and available to the mass public. There's a catch though. Though the prototype was tested on a digital ledger technology, the PBOC realized that this was not suitable as it lacked the capacity to handle such a large number of transactions. We all said the PBOC would prefer a centralized system, <laughs> of course, rather than the decentralized model of blockchain type technologies. This letter reports that Beijing wants control over its cash economy. What we just talked about, as a digital currency may have features that allow the central bank to track transactions. Beijing has denied that. May has all said the aim is to strike a balance between anonymity and battling money laundering and electronic criminality. But here's the last part. For example, user information will not be available to banks. Instead, individual identities would be tied to their e-wallets as now. There it is. It doesn't matter. They state that the banks won't have access to this, but all the information will be tied to their e-wallets. How great is that for them? They can just easily track their e-wallets. They can track their transaction. If my e-wallet is to me, and that's what I use for all my transactions, and I buy milk, bread, a hitman, cocaine, whatever it is, I can't do that. Well, I mean, I could buy the bread and the milk, but everything's tied to my wallet. And if that's the case, they can easily just track that. So you see how easy it is to control everything around you if you have a centralized bank who is giving you this, this digital currency and is tracking your wallet. But here's the great thing. If this happens, and it's going to happen, for every single country out there. They have to respond to this. How is China's ledger, or their centralized bank and all their information, all the transactions that they use, how are we going to be able to transact with that to the US digital currency, or the e-peso, or the <clears throat> whatever else country there is? There has to be some kind of intermediary, something that will bridge the two together. In essence, how do we get two different blockchains to talk to each other? Ladies and gentlemen, enter Ripple. So Ripple has an interoperability, ILP, the Interoperability Ledger Protocol. So real quick, here's what it can do. Ripple Innovation can connect banks, mobile money platforms, stock exchanges, clearinghouses, and different ledgers. By ledgers, I mean blockchains like Ethereum, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and other network of choice. This is an article that I found on medium.com, and it's perfectly illustrates what I'm trying to talk about. The protocol, Interledger protocol, allows users to transact natively on the networks of their choice without needing to move assets to a centralized exchange or to a specific blockchain for training. The Interledger network has no central authority or company, and the protocol is not tied to any currency, token, or blockchain. With Interledger, a user can send Bitcoin, the recipient will automatically receive ETH or whatever their preferred currency happens to be. The assets are exchanged in the flow of the transfer without either party needing to think about how this happens. Before I get before I go in reverse, without either party needing to think about how this happens. This is the grandma test. If your grandma can do it, the adaptability is high. If you need some kind of code or to you know transfer these huge long digital <laughs> uh, digital wallet information from one to the other, it's too difficult. Your grandma's not going to do it. But 
<laughs> if you have your grandma and she can do it, the chances that this will take off throughout the entire mass is very high. So how's this gonna happen? How is XRP and Ripple, how are they going to connect with all the different countries uh, and be that one digital asset that's gonna bridge everything together? I want you guys to step into the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. If you don't know, because I didn't know until I had to do my own research, the IMF is the International Monetary Fund. It was established in 1944. It says here, member, member countries 189, it's more than that now. It's got 24 directors, one trillion amount. The IMF is able to lend to its member countries. So what does it do? The IMF gives advice on how to achieve economic stability, prevent financial crises, and improve living standards. And the IMF works with member countries to modernize their economic policies and institutions to modernize their economic policies. So how's that going to happen? Well, first of all, let's take a look at all their members. These are all the countries that are with the IMF. They are all sitting members of the International Monetary Fund. Brazil, Bulgaria, Rwanda, Canada, Chad, Chile, China, Colombia. United States is there. Dominican Republic, Egypt. It just goes, it's every country you can possibly think of. So if you do a quick Google search, Ripple and the IMF, you're going to see a huge amount of information that's going to come up. You can see what Ripple is doing is they're working behind the scenes, behind the scenes, behind the scenes with central banks, IMF to say, look, you guys have a problem and we have a real world solution. We've proven that it can work. We can have these two ledgers, these two blockchains talk to each other. So when we hear about all these Jamie Dimon stable coins and China uh, centralized coins and all these different things that are happening, I think to myself, so much the better. I could care less because guess what's going to bridge all those things? Ripple's one of them. The Ripple company is one of them or the XRP protocol, their ledger. There's others out there, but I think XRP is making the most strides. They're the one talking to the regulators, talking to people that they need to talk to, and they've put on their board the people that have experiences in dealing with different countries and different central banks. So if uh, <clears throat> if you are doing that, the chance of your success is high. Are, am I saying that they definitely will succeed? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if I had to bet all my money on Bitcoin, I just couldn't do it. Because how do I know? Maybe it's just the first advantage mover. Maybe it's like Casera said, which is it could become obsolete. I don't know. And I don't think anybody can really know. You, and you're going to have maximalists out there that'll say Bitcoin's the only thing out there or Ethereum is the only one or whatever shit coin that's out there they say it is. You got to remember, <clears throat> look at what they do, not what they say. I can tell you right now, I can guarantee most of the people that, are, that say they're maximalists are of Bitcoin are also investing in other digital currencies. Just the way it is, because if you're doing it one, you are an, an incredibly bold gambler. Last but not least, I had to look this up to do my own research, because I didn't understand what the IMF did and what the central banks or the World Bank does. So if you don't understand it, it's no big deal, because it even says up here, if you have difficulties dis distinguishing the World Bank from the International Monetary Fund, you're not alone. Uh, even John Maynard Keynes, a founding father of the two institutions and considered by many the most brilliant econ economist of the 20th century, admitted that he didn't know. He didn't understand the uh, differences. So real quick to go over it, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the International Bank, its primary responsibility for financing economic development. The bank's first loans were extended during the late 40s to finance the reconstruction of the war-ravaged economies of Western Europe. So they were there pretty much to lend out money to help those countries. Now, if you want to go tinfoil hat, you can look at all the negative things that it does. I don't want to get into that. What I do want to just tell you is what it states it does and the difference between that and the IMF. The IMF is essentially to get together with different countries and to help them with their policies and to avoid different hardships or financial, financial issues that will come about, I suppose. But there's a rules. There's rules in place that every member must abide by. 
and the Articles of Agreement signed by all members constitute a code of conduct. The code is simple. It requires members to allow their currency to be exchanged for foreign currencies freely and without restrictions. To keep the IMF informed of changes, they contemplate in financial and monetary policies that will affect fellow members' economies and, to the extent possible, to modify these policies on the advice of the IMF to accommodate the needs of the entire membership. To help nations abide by that code of conduct, the IMF administers a pool of money from which members can borrow when they are in trouble. So again, the World Bank and the IMF, it's kind of hard to distinguish what they do, but essentially IMF sends policy and the World Bank is there to really give out loans. That's how I see it. And if you've got a digital currency who's working behind the scene with these big movers and players, it's a pretty good, pretty good guess. So I know this is a long video, but I felt like this is something when you feel like the economy is crashing, I need to sell and get out. I want you to be smart about it. Do your own research. Come back to this video. Watch it again. See what's happening. See what's changed. Things, things change all the time. But for me, I've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP. And the reason for Ethereum, I feel that smart contracts are going to be huge. I'll cover that in a later video because this one's too long already. I've also got EOS. Again, smart contracts. Cardano, again, smart contracts, and they're very, very patient. And finally, Chainlink. And Chainlink is one of those, they call it an oracle, and it, and it helps to facilitate these smart contracts, and it gets a little bit tricky, and it's something that I will go over in another video, but again, this one's too long. But those are the ones that I feel, one of those are two, three, hopefully all of them, will be big in the future, three, four, five years, and I'm going to hold all of them. As time goes on, I will be buying on the way down and buying on the way up. I will not be buying any more Bitcoin because I already have my position, and I feel like even if it doubles, um, sure, uh, it's going to be hard to double from 7,000 to 14,000, but uh, if I have XRP, it's not too... Uh, crazy to think about 22 cents to 44 cents or 75 cents or a dollar. So I'll be investing in XRP. I'll be investing more in Ethereum and Chainlink. Those will be my next three that I'll be buying probably $25 each one every single week and see what happens. So uh, guys, thanks for hanging with me to the end. I know this was long, a little bit uh, tedious. But it's good information to know, especially moving forward. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe for the next ones. And I will see you uh, for our very next video. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.